Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. It's nice to have you in this space. I hope you can see and hear me okay. My name is Michael. I use he, they pronouns. I am currently based in Barcelona. Uh, for anyone who needs a visual description, I am a white male presenting person in my 30s, got stubble, kind of brown quiffed hair, wearing a black t-shirt, and behind me there's a brick wall with some nature-inspired art on it. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm the founder of We Create Space. Um, a little bit about us. We are a community-led platform, consultancy, and collective of queer change makers. And we're on a mission really to improve the lives of LGBTQ plus people and other underrepresented groups um, around the world. And we currently support uh, over a hundred different corporate partners who are all at varying stages on their DEI journey. And really through consultancy, we design shared learning experiences, we produce DI insights and we craft bespoke content that supports individuals and supports organizations um, with strengthening their roles as change agents um, within their communities. We're also a social enterprise and the profit that we make from the work that we do with these corporate partners goes back into the LGBTQ plus IA community through providing free events uh, both in person and online, like this one, um, as well as free resources, leadership development opportunities, and well-being solutions. And over the last few years, um, we've achieved uh, a, a kind of a lot in my in my kind of perspective. Actually, reflecting back, but we've delivered um, over a, a thousand events and shared experiences, and we've invested. Um, over £350,000 back into the LGBT plus community. There are some ways that you can get involved um, and I'll just kind of talk you through those. You can attend our events as you're doing today. Thank you once again for being here. Um, you can share our social posts, do follow us um, if you're not already. You can amplify uh, our speakers and our projects um, and you could also introduce us to your employer or your colleagues. If it's your first time in this space, welcome. Um, please do reach out to me or my team in the chat um, to request uh, further information or help, whatever you need. Um, and for those returning to our sessions, uh, it's really great to reconnect again um, over what I believe will be a really rich and insightful discussion. So on the menu today, um, our panel are gonna be discussing the topic of navigating data and intersectionality, how to strategically prioritize DEI in times of turbulence. And the panel is gonna be moderated by Jade alongside our panelists, Mercedes, Yasir, and Summer. So we do encourage you to share your thoughts uh, as we go and questions um, throughout the session. You can use the chat or the Q and A function um, if you wish to share uh, anonym anonymously um, or direct yeah a question directly to a specific speaker but with that uh, I'm just going to hand over to Jade to kick us off thank you thanks Michael and uh, welcome everybody as Michael said uh, it's a pleasure to have you join us today if, uh, if it's your first we create space uh, event then welcome uh, and if you're coming back it's great to see you again um, as Michael said, we are going to be exploring the topic of data and intersectionality, a really key dependency there, which we're going to unpick. Um, the panel discussion uh, is going to explore how to work with data more intentionally to create strategies that best support our most marginalised groups during times of turbulence. And we know that the world, around the world, um, hard-won legal protections and rights for queer people are in jeopardy and uh, some of our queer family um, such as our trans siblings have are having their identities debated um, along with uh, ongoing racial injustice um, and so there are lots of challenges um, facing this work um, and we really want to empower you to create real change in diversity equity and inclusion 
Um, and it often comes down to how we, how well we identify and understand problems within all of our cultural ecosystems within our organisations. Um, and as we face the impact of the current economic downturn, um, as well as um, the legal restrictions on sexual orientation and gender identity, applying this intersectional lens is integral to shaping DNI strategies um, that are informed by real multi-dimensional experiences of identity in the workplace. Um, and our ability to navigate data um, can also really impact the quality of those solutions. Um, and so we really want to unpack uh, the importance of data, data so that we can best utilize that. Um, so we are going to kick today's um, session off with a poll. Uh, we'd really love to hear from you. Um, and so question one, uh, which you will see on the screen, um, is how effectively do you think your organization, your current organization, is using DNI data to inform meaningful actions towards inclusion? And the options you will have are very effectively, effectively enough, not sure, there's plenty of room for improvement, and we need help. Um, once you finish that question, the next question that we'd love to get your thoughts on is in what area do you see the most room for improvement in your organization? Understanding the different forms of data and analytics used to explore gaps to DNI, processing data contextually to inform meaningful actions, acting on data efficiently, and learning how to apply an intersectional lens to capture important experiential insights. So we've just got the results come in. And for the first question, um, overwhelmingly, uh, there is plenty of room for improvement is, is showing, um, which I have to say is, is not a surprise, um, but it's encouraging that um, there's room for improvement and improvement speaks to kind of future change. Um, let's have a look on. couple of people saying um, that they are using DNI data very effectively. Um, on question two, we have got the biggest area for opportunity processing data contextually to inform meaningful actions um, coming out as the number one opportunity. Closely followed by understanding different forms of data and analytics and learning how to apply an intersectional lens. So hopefully, in the course of the conversation today, uh, we will be able to draw out some of these themes for, further um, and talk about this more. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I will introduce uh, myself and our speakers. So uh, as Michael mentioned, my name's Jade. Um, I'm non-binary. I've worked in the field of diversity, equity and inclusion uh, for over a decade um, as the uh, thought leader for some global organizations in over 100 countries, and I'm currently the non-exec director for diversity at We Create Space. And I'm joined by some fantastic panelists today, and I'm gonna hand over to Mercedes to introduce uh, themselves. And if you could then hand over to other panelists. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Jade. Hey, everyone. I'm Mercedes, my pronouns are she, her. I am a light-skinned black and Honduran queer woman. Today I'm wearing glasses, overalls, and I'm sitting in my kitchen, which is a mix of light blue colors and wooden countertops. I currently work at Google as an equity strategist and am based in London. And I will pass it off to Summer. Hello, hi. I'm Summer, my pronouns are she, her. I am of Iraqi origin, born and brought up in London, currently living in Mexico. Um, I'm currently working as a contractor for different businesses. My current client is Google. Um, I'm here because last year I project managed the first ever demographic data capture for Natura & Co, which is the world's largest publicly traded B Corp. 
um, so this meant setting up the structure for how this is done for four different brands across 74 different countries and working through each of the tiny details from the legal complexities to the cultural ones, communications, defining different targets, the whole works. Um, and I will pass over to Yasser. Hello everyone, it's great to be here. Yasser, pronouns he, him. Um, uh, Pakistani Muslim background uh, in London. And it's really nice to, uh, to, to, to meet everyone. Um, I've worked in the space of DEI for about 18 years, predominantly leading diversity for media organizations. So I led DEI for The Guardian, for Channel 4, BBC Studios, and now the Financial Times. And uh, data is very much quite a, an important part of telling and progressing a DEI story. So it's really great to be here. Thank you, everyone, uh, and for introducing yourselves. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'm going to kick off the first question, and I'd love to hear from each of you um, uh, and get, garner your thoughts on this. Um, to say that global uh, demographic data collection and extraction is complex is truly an understatement. Countries, researchers, institutions, and NGOs have different motivations for collecting and publishing data, along with varying levels of access to information. If the questions are straightforward, there is generally an expectation that the answer will be straightforward as well. However, we know that this is not the case. Data is collected in censuses, statistics, and surveys will only answer the questions being asked by the data collectors. Legal, political, social, and religious, or habitual preferences guide the data collectors. So knowing the population demographics will not necessarily explain the dynamics of employment, education, public health, or social inequalities, bias, discrimination, or exclusion. So with this in mind, I'd like to open the discussion, spotlighting the different forms of data and analytics that are used to identify DNI data gaps and, op and opportunities. Uh, and when we talk about data of this kind, what exactly are we talking about? Um, and so really kind of just opening up that distinction of, of data. And I'm going to come to Mercedes first. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. There are so many different types of data. Uh, and I think I've already seen it in the chat, but I do think something that is important to reiterate, and Jade, you just mentioned this, is that there are restrictions to data, and there is some data, depending on the size or maturity of where your company is at in collecting data, that you might not ever be able to access. And I think that that's just something that's really important to keep in mind. And at the same time, shouldn't be a barrier for doing equity and DEI related work. Uh, there's tons of data. Oftentimes when you are going through an interview process, your, um, your recruiter might ask you to opt in for some data. When you onboard uh, to a company, often you are opting in to sharing some data. There's representation data that a company can have, which is hiring plus the attrition, the folks that are leaving the company. There's progression data, how are folks moving through a company? And then there's just attrition data, folks leaving, what does that mean? And then I think something that I have observed, particularly working with senior leadership, is the lack of emphasis on leveraging qualitative data. I think oftentimes when we think about data, we think about numbers and numbers are so important. I don't want that to um, be like thrown on the back burner, but also qualitative data and understanding the why and the mental models behind just the numbers is also incredibly important and really rich and can help us understand um, what is being seen and felt and heard in a different way. And my illuminate those numbers in a very different way. And that could look like employee sentiment data um, that's gathered from myriad different teams, could be understanding the lived experience of folks who are part of employee resource groups, could be what are leaders and decision makers seeing, what's learning and behavioral data we have. Mm. Um, and then also even just thinking about uh, as DEI practitioners, what are we learning from the strategies we are employing? So like feedback and learning loops, um, how do we know our strategies are working and how are we then sharing that back with the folks that we're doing this work with and for? And so I think 
all of that kind of wrapped in are a few different um, important data points that we can leverage. Thank you, Mercedes. I think um, you just touched on some amazing points around the employee life cycle and kind of some of those key touch points where we have the opportunity to capture employee data uh, and the point around sentiment and sensitive data and the duality of not only knowing who you are, but how you feel uh, is a really key link there. Um, so I'd love to bring you in um, and get your thoughts on this question um, around the different kind of forms of data. Um, over to you. Yeah, of course. Um, I definitely wanted to echo something Mercedes just said. So really agree with the fact that the numbers are not all of it. So the qualitative data is very important. So when we talk about DNI data, we're not just considering the numbers of how many people from different demographics um, are part of your organization. We're actually considering their experiences and how they feel day to day when they show up to work. Um, we, when we think of demographic data, you think of kind of different protective characteristics such as race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, disability, there's many more that I could name. Um, but we really need to delve into the experiences. So similar to some of the ones Mercedes mentioned, looking at promotion data, are there different groups being promoted at the same pace? Um, understanding demographics by grade, do you have the same representation in your junior roles as you do in your senior roles? Engagement data is very important. So really understanding how people feel, are they feeling engaged? Do they feel included day to day? in each of the different demographic groups. Um, recruitment data, um, retention data Mercedes mentioned, um, and then really using data to measure the progress of your different initiatives. So if you started a program to support different groups in, in different historically excluded communities, is this data then used, uh, you can then use this data to track, are you being successful in this? Are there other opportunities to improve? Um, and using it in these kinds of ways are super important. Other things to consider, it's not just your employees, you can use data to try and um, understand the partners you work with, your consultants, people along your supply chains, are they all being inclusive with historically excluded groups in the same way that you, you are trying to show up as an organization doing? Um, and then, yeah, I think they are kind of the main, main parts and just also highlighting that um, when you are collecting data, just being really conscious of why you are collecting the data and what you're doing with it are really key factors, not just collecting data to kind of say we've got a number, but actually knowing what you're doing with that before you start collecting it is probably one of the most important pieces, I would say. Thank you, Summer. And um, that point at the end around the why behind the capture of data, I think is so crucial. Um, people often underestimate the compact that's being and, and the, um, the trust that we're building with people when we're asking for this information. And so understanding what it's going to go on to inform and having some intention around that is really important. You see, I would love to bring you into the conversation around um, the different kinds of data and analytics that we're talking about at an organizational level. Clearly, we've heard from some about some of the key touch points, um, but is there anything else you'd like to add to that? I mean, I think what Mercedes and Sam covered are really brilliant. I mean, it gives a full life cycle of both qualitative and quantitative data. I think the the um, picking up the point on the why, um, why are we doing this? And I think for me, there's two, two, it's twofold because we want to create a level playing field and we want to promote the value of difference and using these tools will help us be forensic. For me, I think there's a bit, um, there's something around gathering data, but then doing really good comparisons. So if we look at engagement scores and you have a number of tools that to, to, ex to explore and give indicators on feeling included, being authentic self, my managers is inclusive, enough effort on DNI has been done. I, I, the ultimate aim is to cr create equilibrium. So all four of us, will have a different view and, and a different experience but ultimately the aim is is to get us all on, a, on, a, on a, an equal playing field because I think what sometimes organizations do they take a, a whole organizational average on how included their staff base is and that will always be skewed by the majority and what you want to do is to really slice it dice it by differences and to see what the what what does the story tell there's a big context to it or it needs a bit of contextualizing with um, I would say how people feel um, and uh, what is happening in the outside world. So the question of why, as in why are we, why are we doing this, is about what does good look like, what, the, what is your North Star? 
and this is these are our sort of sophisticated ways of measuring in order for us to achieve what we want to do. So I think it has to be a sort of a total part of a total piece. Thank you for that. Um, I think uh, just some kind of just a kind of key takeaway from that question. I think it's that data is um, the beginning and not the end, and data is not information on its own. And to Yasir's point, um, how we analyze that data and through what lens to contextualize those experiences and, and then create targeted action plans to change those experiences is really important to understanding why we're doing things. Um, just kind of building on this, so when we're when collecting data uh, or when reviewing statistics, we should look at other information. Uh, and that may include external information, uh, scientific papers, historically of exclusion, the history of exclusion, sorry, and the unique complexities of each country. I think the global context here can't be understated uh, to understand who may or may not feel comfortable sharing their demographic information. Um, to assume that everybody has the same landscape or relationship with data of this kind is wrong. Uh, and actually some of the, uh, the history or the way in which this data has been collected and used and weaponized against uh, people from historically excluded groups uh, needs to be kind of acknowledged. Um, we can expect groups that are already marginalized or historically excluded to under-report their demographics in surveys, and that may be because they're in fear of that, of people being in receipt of this information, is this going to be used against me? But also, um, it comes back to this trust and confidence piece of do I trust the person that I'm giving this really personal information to? And if the environment, the global environment I'm in is not safe for me to exist in, then there's a real responsibility that comes with that data. And I can see in the chat, people have been talking about the topic of anonymity and aggregation, which we'll come on to later, uh, which is very important um, in that compact that we're making with individuals and their sensitive information. So on question two, um, I'd love to explore what helpful guidance you would give organisations to process data contextually and inform meaningful actions. What key things should people be aware of and how do we prepare as businesses to maximize the analysis of this data? So we've touched on this before, when we collect the data, what are we gonna do with it? Um, and I'd love to come to you, Yusuf. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, for me, I sort of look at it in, in a way of what is the sto organizational story for, for DEI? Where do they wanna be? What does good look like for them? And then how does data play a part in helping them achieve that? And often data is the starting point, but I think that shouldn't just be the starting point and then the rest falls into place after, because then I think you lose the lose the purpose of it. Um, just to very quickly um, mention, I mean, what you talked on around global data, some countries is illegal to ask questions on race, some questions is illegal to ask questions on sexual identity. Other, question, other countries have a different set of uh, questions on disability. So, so I think the basis of legal understanding and then culturally what's the right thing to do because often in the pursuit of our agenda, we could potentially be exposing certain individu individuals, putting their lives at risk. So if you've got countries in the world where it's illegal to be us, and we're, we're doing a drive from a, as a global perspective, and it's great in the organization, you're creating a space for them, but that actually could impact their lives externally. So I think there's a, the legal, then obviously the social. Um, the, the way I've always, uh, or the way I sort of see it is, for me, it's uh, uh, figuring out what the organization is doing. So you're in sort of SWOT analysis of what's working well and what's not. Doing a horizon scan of, what similar organizations are doing. So at the FT, we did a horizon scan of what, you know, New York Times, Guardian, Bloomberg, Thomson Reuters were doing in the space of DNI. Then I uh, did an assessment of where I thought we were at on this maturity model to say, and I kind of did a not scientific way of just saying that here's where I think our competitors are at in the maturity model of zero to five. Here's where I think the FT is at. And then did a sort of deep dive listening exercise to get a sense of what our employees feel brought a, a group of stakeholders together to just to say, okay, so this is where we're at. This is where we rate. This is what our competitors are doing. This is how our organization feels. Threw it all on the table. We did a series of ideation exercises to say, right, 
we could do a hundred things and probably not do it so well. Let's focus on three to four really good key priority areas. Let's define what good looks like for us and then get that sort of back in behind. So everyone was sort of part of that process, distilled down into three, four pillars and then defined what the goals, what, what, what's gonna help us achieve that. So what, the, what are the numbers, whether it's representation goals or targets or engagement scores or early careers or whatever that may be. And then you create a, almost like a, a governance structure around that to, to measure and track. So you're seeing you go on track and then you work backwards. That for me is where the, the data and the numbers pit, bit fits in. Because I think if you start off by capturing data, it will grow and grow, but then you just don't know what you want to do with it. So it's about defining good and then using the data to, to match that up. So I think that's um, the best way I've tried to manage it because as we've just discussed and everyone's just mentioned, it's some of the data is hard. It's not gonna give a complete picture. Uh, we've got restrictions, we've got cultural restrictions, and um, so it only forms a small part of what you want to do. I think I think the point that you've raised is such an important one because I think representativeness alone, you know, does not complete the understanding of that experience. And so supplementing kind of that, um, you know, demographic data is so crucial, but also um, just in the way that you've prepared the business and saying, actually, what does good look like? What are our success indicators? How do we want people to, to come on this journey with us? I think a lot of businesses, it might be that you're looking to, um, it might be that you're looking to increase the representation of an under, of a historically excluded group into management. But actually, I think if you just pursue the data without thinking about the culture of inclusion and belonging and how people feel, um, just inserting lots of diversity actually drives up a culture of conflict. And so we have to have managers and leaders that are equipped to manage diverse teams in a way where we have high performing teams that have really good rigor. And I think your point around not just pursuing the representation alone and actually thinking about, well, why are we doing this? Is what I've just taken from your answer there. Um, and it's amazing to know that the FT is kind of behind you on that approach. Um, so just kind of moving through to the next sort of section, collecting a wide suite of demographics is central to understanding the experiences and perceptions of different groups. Traditional data analytics may, however, overlook the connections between different demographic characteristics and thereby fail to capture important disparities between employees and individual experiences. Intersectionality is a concept in social theory created by Kimberly Crenshaw that examines the way in which oppressive institutions such as racism and sexism are interconnected. Intersectionality acknowledges that forms of oppression do not act independently of one another. Instead, they intersect to create an intersectional experience for those who possess minority identities. And with this in mind, organizations are curious to learn more about how and why we need to apply this intersectional lens to capture important insights. Can you tell us a little bit from your experience why this is so important and the value that it yields? And Mercedes, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, it's a really important question. And I think that there's a lot of overlapping um, with Yasser's answer and response around understanding where your organization is in the first place. And I think even before you start thinking about what is our approach, it is understanding what is the maturity level of our organization when it comes to understanding, even at a very, very foundational level, do my leaders understand what diversity means in this context, globally, in this region, in this market? Do people understand the difference between equity and equality? And I know so much of this conversation, at least I, I've been in the DEI space for over 10 years. We're like, we've been talking about this for 10 years. But still, these are really important critical foundations that need to be built in order to do our due diligence in this work. And so it is really important to understand where leaders and decision makers are in their understanding of these concepts, but also how have they currently been applying those? Um, and this is a really helpful data point because it, under, it helps you understand where you need to go, what gaps exist, 
Um, and you can kind of like parallel path the priorities you need to center along with that intersectional approach. What I have observed when you don't apply that intersectional approach and why it's so important is we're human, right? We have biases that show up. So of course, they're going to show up when we create DEI plans too. And so sometimes when we are creating those plans, whether it's unconscious or conscious, um, we can tend to see groups as monoliths. We can tend to do siloed work. Uh, we can tend to miss the interconnectedness of the strategies that we're trying to implore. And so we often center what's front of mind, what is default, what we believe to be the norm. And so when we maybe, let's say hypothetically, we're creating a program to support women. If we don't critically think about who we are centering in that work and why we are centering women, we might default to centering straight white cis women. Or if we're trying to understand employee sentiment across the Black community, we might only consider the binary of Black men and Black women and not consider the queer experience, the trans experience, the, um, the neurodivergent experience, um, and even not even recognize that within those identities, there isn't one single story. And so to always ask ourselves, um, who is missing in this data? Who is missing in this story? What is the context inside and outside the workplace that can help us understand that problem or that story better? And then I think really thinking about as we're creating a strategy um, and we really want to center intersectionality, thinking about who are we centering in this work? Who are we centering in this data? Uh, and being really honest about that. And I think some of the things that, that those questions and applying that framework to how we are creating strategies or programs can yield just more robust and intentional strategies and programs, um, more like precise and clear goals and benchmarks. It also, I think, forces leaders and decision, decision makers to refuse to be like mis or uninformed about progress or work uh, when we really are targeted about who we are centering our work versus a very big, broad group where a lot of things can be hidden if we're not precise in what we are trying to achieve. Um, and so that's why I think that intersectional approach is so important. And some of those questions can really yield um, stronger strategies and really help um, at different levels from like a leadership level to an individual contributor level, the ability to understand what we are doing and why we are doing it, which is also really important as well. I, I mean, you know, you just shared so many valuable perspectives there, Mercedes, and I think, um, you know, the intersectional experience and how that correlates with the power and the, and the uh, agency that we have as individuals and how that, you know, the further we move away, the more intersectional identities we inhabit, the greater barriers that we may encounter. And I think when we're looking at equity and we're looking at meeting people where they're at, that's a really important point. And I think intersectionality um, as a concept should be as a, a design principle for much of this work throughout diversity, equity and inclusion and everything we're doing, as you say, it, it's guiding businesses so that you don't allow yourself to go to default because the, whether it's heteronormativity, whether it's the binary, it's about saying think beyond that because we're looking for the fullest human experience and we're multifaceted, complex people um, whose experiences are not the same. And I think there'll be shared experiences and there'll be common challenges that emerge from this data um, that allow you to refine focus. The other point that you mentioned as well, I think um, a lot of businesses um, get kind of trapped in this circle of waiting for data to act. And I think there's a very delicate balance here in saying, yes, we want to build the data infrastructure and we want to capture this data year over year. We want to understand what that means. But if we're at the start of that journey, then this is a much longer term commitment for establishing the infrastructure, continually using this to promote your culture change work. And I think if you if you over if you focus on the experience and on the programs and projects whilst you're also capturing this data then yes you can go back and refine it and tweak it and test it 
But I think if you wait to have the data before you start to do the proactive intervention work, um, which a lot of people may argue that you don't have the uh, the scope to go refined, I think you do um, in that we do know who which groups have been historically excluded and there is information and we can look at our common sense experience. So uh, fantastic kind of um, share there. Summer, uh, moving through to section four, um, data of this kind represents the beginning of a journey and organisations must commit and embrace a longer term commitment to inclusion, representation and inclusive outcomes. The focus must be to build data and analytics infrastructure, one that matures and develops over time alongside the businesses so that meaningful actions can be taken. Building on the trust and confidence with employees so that people are encouraged to participate because uh, it's having a real world impact and we can see that happening around them. So could you please share ways that organizations can prepare and equip teams to responsibly act on the data, including key considerations that they should be aware of? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Jade. Um, I want to start by doubling down on something you just said. So especially the first time you ever do a demographic data capture or DI capture, um, it's really important to try and build long lasting infrastructure that you can build on year on year. It is iterative and the participation you want, you might not get the first time. Um, but what you do want to do is be set up to build on this in the future. Um, and as you mentioned, it, we do already know um, what groups we're trying to support. So we can be doing other work in the absence of the data. Um, but as we are doing it, before you capture the data, um, there's a few things you need to put in place that's super important. So be really clear about who can see the data once you get it, what levels of data they'll be able to see. Set that earlier on so there's not a bias in that ever being changed after the data is available. Um, be really conscious about who can see it. If you commit to it being anonymous, make sure you set up all the right mechanisms for that data to stay truly anonymous. Um, build psychological safety within your organization so that people are clear on what's being asked of them and why it's being asked of them, what their data is going to be used for. Um, and then they are able to ask questions, feel openly talking about the topic and getting involved in the topic too. That doesn't, that isn't something that naturally happens. It's something that needs to be consciously embedded into an organization. Um, and then going and setting a really clear communication strategy and, and really communicating who's actually going to see that data what you're going to do with it, set clear timelines on um, when you're going to come back and communicate the outcomes, what the things you're going to be doing are, um, so everyone who participates really understands it. Then when you're actually preparing for the data to come through, you really should be training your organisation and the people who are going to handle the data and what it is they're going to be doing with it and how they can use it. So especially in large organisations, um, you might end up with, or small ones too, but a lot of aggregated anonymous data that people in different functions globally, local teams, more leadership teams might not know what to do with it. So making sure you sit down with them and they understand how to do this and how to track the different initiatives they're working on and such um, with what the information they have is. Um, think about how you're going to distribute the data. Um, so are you going to have your marketing team in France seeing the data for their team or is it going to be the marketing team globally? Um, and that will then determine the types of targets you're able to set. So being really conscious about your targets, but the targets are going to determine what outcomes later come. So being really careful about the targets you want um, to set using your data afterwards. Manage your leadership teams. That's a really important one. So as we spoke about earlier, the first time you do this, you might not get all the answers. You want to be fully representative. So really managing your leadership teams to not be going after the numbers, but to really be diving into the experiences and the whole DI strategy as a whole, rather than just the demographic data capture is super important. Um, these are people on the other side of it. We're just not talking about numbers. We're talking about humans. And that's a really important message to make sure that it's getting across to all of your leadership teams. Um, defining what kind of data is representative enough before you get it so um, if you for a certain area of the organization only 20 percent of the people respond is that data you're going to act on or use probably not um, and setting that number up front so that when you get the responses you don't kind of feel on edge that you need to be communicating something but you haven't got enough data and you start playing with the numbers like if there's there's a number that you're going to deem as representative enough participation stick to that number afterwards and set it earlier on um, and then really clearly defining your benchmarking, your metrics and your success indicators before you get the results to avoid any bias. And then once you've got the data, there's a number of things you can do with it. So setting mechanisms to ensure different groups are being promoted at the same pace, 
creating initiatives to support those who aren't, um, creating targeted training and learning development initiatives for specific groups, training your leaders. You can start with topics such as psychological safety to really understand, for them to understand creating safety within their own teams and clear communication pathways between everyone they work with um, from the more junior roles upwards creating mentoring opportunities across the organization. And that's not just for more junior roles, that's also reverse mentoring um, for your leaders, Cre using the data to support budget conversations for teams to so really making sure that each of your teams have the correct budgets to act on the data appropriately. Um, looking at recruitment. So recruitment, there's a number of different initiatives you can do. You can be launching inclusive hiring principles. You can be training anyone involved in recruitment processes. You can be working on your external brand. Um, through my own personal experiences, I would say recruitment is maybe the last thing you should be working on. Working on your internal culture is super important to be doing first. Um, I've worked with an organization previously who went very extreme on hiring first up without creating culture internally. There was kind of a massive change in the recruitment numbers. And then within six months, everyone had left the organization because the culture was not set up to kind of promote people of different um communities or to really make them feel included day to day in their roles. So kind of coming to that recruitment and that external branding lens after you've built your culture internally that is inclusive and supportive of all the communities you're trying to work to support. So much to unpack there. Um, fantastic kind of contribution, Summer. Thank you for your answer. I think um, a couple of things that kind of stood out to me in that, I think is around equipping people with this notion um, that we want to supplement this data. So we're, we're gonna capture kind of um, the demographic data, but then we want to understand through the, as Mercedes mentioned earlier, the listening, um, and, and there's also a comment in the chat around utilizing employee resource groups to uh, contextualize through experience and conversation, what the full experience is, um, and actually saying, does it pass the common sense check? Are we, as you say, when you're in an organization you know how culturally things feel and you know that broadly speaking some things are visual representation is easier to determine and i think when we're capturing this data it's about saying does this chime with the common sense check before you then assign resource um, on the back of these data studies the other thing that i think you mentioned which is crucially important is managing those senior expectations managing the leadership teams um, there's a huge um, appetite for capturing this information at the moment and therefore businesses want the data at any cost. And I think putting some guardrails up about the expectations that we set with employees, the fact that we cannot guarantee participation this time or into the future, we may not get increased participation next year. That is a byproduct of the conversation and the trust that we build with employees about what we're doing, why this information is crucial to improving their experience, why they should have um, put their trust in us, um, and also to say, this is how we plan to proceed. And when you talk about focusing on the internal culture, it's really about saying, where are the opportunities today in the organization? Inclusive leadership, inclusive hiring, looking at the our talent management and progression routes for people. Does everybody have the same access to these opportunities? Those things we can work on and we can make those processes more inclusive without having lots of data. And whilst we continue to harvest that data through an infrastructure where it's gonna have longevity, that's I think the real key part here. This isn't just a data exercise that we're gonna capture once. This is something we're going to have to review long into the future to, to really embed in the way that the business acts on this information. Uh, and that maturity and sophistication comes over time. Um, I think the other point that came out there was around um, the representativeness of the data. Um, it's, a very, it's a very difficult question from a statistician perspective. That number is uh, very difficult to define. So we need to look at the total workforce composition um, through either a market and global lens. And that may include rolling data up. So if you don't have enough data in a market, then we can look at the global experience. But when you look at the global experience, that omits the local experience. So you're constantly offsetting how 
meaningful is this information and to what degree can we act on the back of it through the various things that you've shared um so thank you so much um for this i mean it's a massive topic um and today we've managed to kind of open up some of these key themes um it's a conversation we'd love to continue and i know that many of our uh, partners are very interested in this topic um i would love to open out um to a q a um We've had some conversations in, we've had some questions, sorry, in the chat um, and some comments. So I'm just going to start with around the anonymity piece. Um, and so there was a question around uh, anonymity. And I think uh, you see I mentioned the global context for this data capture. What can you legally ask in what region and how must you ask it in that region? And, and that looks different. Uh, on a global landscape. So when we talk about uh, making things anonymous or not anonymous, Sama, I'd love to hear from you just around how we can use, um, how, how you can respond to that legal guidance uh, in order to make sure that we're either A, capturing it anonymously, or um, we may not have access to raw data, but who would in that instance? Yes. Yeah, um, you can aggregate the data in ways so that you're not ever seeing it on an individual level. Um, so, for example, you would say until we hit 20 people of X, Y and Z community, we will not know that that many people have responded. Now, it becomes very difficult when you look at intersectional identities, because we could say we are only looking at people of this certain ethnicity um, in this team once we hit 20 people. But then you won't see kind of if you were looking at, for example, people from um, Arab backgrounds, but women, then you've now hit it down to a much lower number. You may never hit that number. This is where it becomes very difficult with the numbers because um, you start hitting, you start missing out smaller populations, it gets a lot harder to see intersectional identities and the anonymous piece becomes a lot harder. But the problem is, is you do like the, the realistic situation is you do need to keep the data very anonymous. So you need to be very conscious about that before you go out asking for the data, how you're going to manage it and what you're going to do with it. Because if you set the thresholds too high, you get no data, you set the thresholds too low, you're breaching someone's anonymity. So it is a balancing game. Um, it is kind of something you need to be paying a lot of attention to and a lot of time to. Um, and just really, I guess, it, it depends on kind of the culture of the organisation, mm -hmm. what kind of stance that they're going to take on it. But the key thing here is being very transparent with anyone you're catching data on, on what that is. So keeping the transparency for people who are sharing their data. And just to build on that, Rob, I've just seen you uh, in the chat and seeing this question come up. So essentially, where, where uh, in certain countries you can ask the data, but it has to be if it's going to be anonymous. And in some cases, if you're capturing the data on an internal HR system, that would not be deemed anonymous. Therefore, you would bring in a third party who can ask and capture the data. You as an organization never have access to the raw data. It is provided back in an aggregate form once you've applied the anonymity threshold, as Summer just said. So you would have to define at what number, once you receive that data, are we going to do to uphold those principles? But in some regions, uh, employees can be invited through various levels of consent gathering, express consent, wet signature, implied consent, whether they can go on to share the information. And so I think that piece is really important just to kind of build on what was said in the chat. In some instances, you may be able to capture this data um, business to business. In some instances, you may need the support of a third party um, in supporting you with capturing that data so that you don't compromise anonymity. And that's really important in that contract and compact of trust that we're building with the business. Using words such as anonymous, if the survey is not truly anonymous, can be really problematic. And so you need to uphold those principles and communicate what that is through privacy notices and so on your opportunity to communicate to employees what the legal framework in your jurisdiction is. Um, and uh, just to add to this, so um, Mercedes, as somebody kind of that's been involved in the capture of DNI data, you can see in the chat um, the requirement to uh, bring in um, privacy and, and legal experts. I know doing this project in over 100 countries for, for global businesses, you do that in partnership with lawyers, and data privacy experts and external um, organizations. 
Can you talk to me a little bit about that partnership piece and how crucial that is in achieving these really kind of lofty uh, goals? Yes. And I would offer that, of course, the larger the company, most likely the more resources and more collective folks will be a part of that process. And I think um, my legal partners are my best friends. Uh, They are so knowledgeable. And uh, especially if you are supporting a region um, like Europe, Middle East, um, and Africa, again, there are so many different nuances, country to country, region to region. It is really important that you partner with whoever you can, whether that is a privacy team, um, your legal partners, uh, even your HR. uh, At Google, we have people consultants and we have people partners who work really closely um, with some of the more like general HR data that employees opt in to share. And so as a collective, we all work to ensure that our processes, like we are following the guidelines very much to um, some of the guidelines that um, Samar had mentioned about like, are we meeting our thresholds? Do we have actual rationale to capture this data? Do we have consent? Um, But a lot of that is um, creating some, um, our legal partners will create kind of like a project plan and all of us will play a different role across how that data is being um, uh, approved. Um, Sometimes we will request data for a project or for initiative or for a hypothesis that we have, and sometimes that will be rejected. Um, And so we go back and we gather more insights. And that's really where some of that qualitative data can really help play a piece is it's really hard to prove that you need data if they're asking for data to prove that. And so thinking about what are the other pieces um, of the puzzle that we can use, um, but you partner with those folks to make the case and then actually run that process. And then usually there's a really tight, small group of folks who get that data and then policies and practices around who gets to see the data, how's the data being used, when will the data be deleted? Um, and and or updated and mm. kind of a feedback loop. Now that you have that data, now that you've initiated X, Y, or Z, what are we learning? And do we need this data? Did it help us? If not, um, we like delete the data. Um, we don't just, I think that that's also something to consider is if you're not using the data, it's really important that we delete that data because it is um, personal and private um, data. I don't know if that answers your question, but there are a lot of people, especially um, at a company um, of Google size, that work to make sure uh, that we're doing as much as we can around the guardrails that exist across mm. um, an entire region. I think it's a great answer, and I think it speaks to the, leg- the, the legislative and the regulatory requirements of a project of this scale and complexity. I mean, this is something that requires robust pro- a project management with the specialists in place to galvanise and gather that market regional uh, requirements, because region by region, category by category in the protected characteristics looks different. What can you ask? How can you ask it? Um, and under what requirements, either internal gathering, external gathering, and so on. You see it, we've got um, probably one to two minutes, but I wanted to get your thoughts on another question in the chat. Um, But very good question in terms of, um, how do you find trying to make data useful when dealing with with a global company? For example, collecting ethnicity when each region uses different definitions or focuses on ethno linguistic differences. Um, And really, I guess that question speaks to how can you um, preempt, as we have in the past as well, um, uh, the mapping of ethnicity uh, data so that when you're participating in the survey, you're seeing options that resonate with your identity. But then when you're analyzing the data as a global leader like yourself, how do you roll that data up um, so that you can make meaningful global decisions? It's a great question, actually, and it speaks to the taking a step back of why you're looking to capture ethnicity data in different regions, because I think it speaks to um, 
what does DNI mean? So you've got global local narrative. And if you've got a global narrative of culture or global narrative of diversifying a workforce, I think if you take Asia, for example, it probably would be pretty, would be, it wouldn't be as meaningful to capture um, local ethnicity data in some of the Asia, Asia regions because actually they're at a different place and you could focus it more on say education or gender. So for me, it's about defining what your priority areas are. So for example, at the FT, we have as global organization, we have UK, US, Asia, and we have Bulgaria. And our ethnicity goals are very much the UK and US, but we do different types of work in Asia and Bulgaria. So it's not, it's not, we're not, that's not a priority area. It's just we're doing, we're addressing inclusion and diversity very, very differently in Asia because we could capture that data. It just would kind of be redundant really. So I think it's figuring out, uh, for me, I like to think of it as uh, global local and you have a strong narrative that fits across the whole organization, but then figuring out what do you want to do regionally and if that means collecting ethnicity data regionally that's absolutely fine but I think um, for me probably wouldn't wouldn't need to want to do something else. I think it's a great point and I think that it speaks to the nuance so it may be that a global business is going to set as you say these global priorities which informs what you collect how you collect it why you collect it and what you're going to do with it um, alternatively, uh, we did kind of a 92.5% full organisational participation in 100 countries. And what that required, uh, and some of uh, worked very closely with me on this, um, is looking at the language, the groups, the cultural significance and relevance of asking these questions. And then how do we map that back and roll it up so you have this global view? Um, and so there's a couple of options there for people on the call, um, both of which are very valid. Um, and it may come down to resource, which is a really super important point. If you've only got a finite amount of resource, go small, capture information, act on it, build that trust and confidence, talk about that and then review your scope. Um, I'm conscious we're almost at the hour. Michael, I'm going to invite you back in so that you can share the survey that we'd love to invite people to complete. Thank you to all panellists. It's a massive topic, um, one that I'm sure we can revisit and continue. But thank you to everybody that's listened um, and goodbye from me. Thank you so much, Jade. And thank you so much, um, Summer, Mr. Ladies, uh, Ms. Sir, and um, uh, also, um, yes, let's get this uh, feedback form. It dropped in the chat. Um, if anyone has any um Comments, they can also email those directly. We have some more sessions coming up. So in the next uh, live panel discussion, we're actually gonna be unpacking the foundations of psychological safety. I know that came up a few times in today's discussion um, and how it can transform our leadership to support the well-being of our colleagues and create space for innovation. Um, for those of you also in London, Barcelona and Berlin, we have in-person events taking place over the next few months. So do register with us. Um, remember to put your location. Um, and yeah, if you want to get in touch or you'd like any more information on how we can support you, please do get in touch. We'll leave you just with some a couple of minutes to fill out the survey. We'd be very grateful. This informs how we improve our sessions moving forward um, and also kind of gives us inspiration for what um, sessions yeah, we design in the future. So uh, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day or your evening and see you soon.